Welcome to episode number 42 of the Animals at Home podcast. My name is Dylan. Thank you very much for joining me today. If you are enjoying the podcast, a review or rating on the Apple iTunes app is always greatly appreciated and sharing on social media is literally the best way to help support the podcast. As well, you can go to animalsathome.ca slash shop and pick yourself up a t-shirt or a sweater. $5 does get donated to the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy for every shirt sold. If you are in the market for anything reptile related, I highly recommend you go check out the show's sponsor, CustomReptileHabitats.com. In the show notes as well as the YouTube description, there is a link to the website. This link is an affiliate link, which means if you do end up purchasing something, a small commission does come back to me at no extra cost to you, which does, of course, support the show. If you're looking for enclosures, backgrounds, decors, Custom Reptile Habitats does have it all. They also have these amazing complete reptile kits ball pythons, bearded dragons, chameleons, corn snakes, crested geckos, really amazing kits that come with everything you need to get started and I'm glad to see proper kits getting put together unlike the Zoomed death kit that we talked about on last week's episode, the chameleon kit. If you're not sure what that is, definitely go back and check out my episode with Drew Reeves. And speaking of proper reptile care and proper equipment and enrichment, This would be a great moment for me to introduce today's guest. Today, I'm chatting with Dr. Anderson, who is a exotic vet in the United States. This is one of those conversations that I'm going to easily be able to split up into a bunch of different clips and post them on YouTube because I think we did cover a bunch of ground. We discussed vitamin D toxicity. We discussed UVB lighting. We discussed obesity in reptiles, how to find a good exotic vet, and the list continues to go on. You guys helped me build this episode. Many of you guys sent in questions that you would have asked uh, an exotic vet if you had the opportunity. I tried to get to as many as possible within the hour. I think I got through almost all of them, so you'll find those in this episode as well. And like I said, I'm definitely going to split this episode up into small bite-sized bits on YouTube because I think this will be very, very shareable content and a really important important resource for people who are in the hobby now as well as newcomers. Here's my conversation with Dr. Anderson. All right. Well, Andy, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Well, you are an exotics vet and naturally as a reptile keeper, I have a million questions for you and partly getting ready for this interview, I asked a bunch of my listeners on Instagram questions that they have and they came up with a a bunch of different things. So we're going to try to see if we can get through a lot of this stuff today. Before we do, what led you down the path of, of becoming a vet, specifically an exotics vet? Is this something that you always wanted to do or is this something you kind of found along the way? Uh, I think like most veterinarians, I always loved animals. So as a kid, I was always finding lizards and turtles and bringing them home or randomly finding dogs in the park and befriending them. Um, so that aspect was always there. But then as I got further in school, I really like the the constant learning and how things change. Um, there's always something new to learn. There's always something for me to update myself with. And I like that, you know, it's not ever stagnant. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Definitely um, when you're in a medical profession, like vet or or on the human side, it's it's a perpetual growth, perpetual yeah. learning. Yeah, and I like that. It keeps me, it keeps me occupied and, you know, you're never bored. So in terms of uh, reptiles and exotics, is that something that you had interest as a kid? Obviously, you said you, you had animals, but did you have pets growing up? We, I had, um, I had a dog and then um, I had various wildlife that I would bring home and keep for a little while, but I was never allowed to keep anything long term, um, which now looking back was really good of my parents. You know, I, I learned to enjoy things and then take them back and put them where they belong. Um, it wasn't until I got older and on my own that I actually had like exotic pets. Yeah, no, that's, uh, I, I went through the same thing. You find like a baby bird outside and you think, okay, I'll rehab this for a little while and then release right. it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which I think is great. You learn to appreciate them, but then they go back where they belong. Yeah, exactly. Well, I think we can jump into some of these topics that we were hoping to discuss today because, sure. um, I, I think they will be very helpful. And and there were sort of three main ones I wanted to discuss, and then we'll get into some other things as well. But the first thing was vitamin D uh, uh, toxicity, basically, which kind of runs under different names, you know, overdose, yeah. vitamin D overdose or yeah. um, hypervitaminosis and whatnot. This is something that I feel like not a lot, or maybe m- I think more keepers are becoming more aware of it now, but it's something that's almost new in, in terms of the reptile industry, just sort of by virtue of supplementations and whatnot. So maybe we can talk just a little bit about that. Yeah, I think um, 
I think it's been around and happening probably a lot longer than we were aware. Um, but vet med was kind of behind for a little while. So a, a lot of people were keeping reptiles for a lot longer than there was available veterinary care. So we just didn't know that it was something that was happening. Yeah. So just to kind of break down what it is, it's, um, I guess, I guess for the most part, the reason that this is happening, I guess the, really the only reason that it's happening is because synthetic vitamin D is a common supp- supplement in the industry and that's Correct. being paired with, with UVB lighting. Is that the main issue? Yeah. I mean, the main issue is really the UV lighting doesn't have a whole lot to do with it. They, you can expose them to as much UVB uh, light as, as um, you want and their bodies will stop processing you know, they have a fail safe mechanism. It's when we supply synthetic vitamin D that the problem happens. Right. And yeah, it's, it's one of the things that I had speculated was, you know, as the hobby started to evolve, and we started realizing the importance of vitamin D and the importance of providing UVB, people are still, uh, like you said, you can't overdose vitamin D through the UVB. But if you're providing, if you're still providing the, the synthetic vitamin D, then that's obviously a problem. So what are some of the symptoms that, that people can watch for in terms of so what this causes? So uh, unfortunately, there's nothing very, you know, there's not one thing that says, hey, this is hypervitaminosis D. It's kind of a general, you know, grouping of findings. But usually by the time they come in to see me, um, they're, they're anorexic, they're lethargic. Some keepers will notice that they're producing more liquid urine than, than is normal for them. Um, but generally, it's just kind of a, an overall malaise or they just seem off. Hmm. Is it something that you're commonly seeing brought into the clinic? I, it's not super common. Uh, and I think that's more because people aren't bringing them into the clinic. I think right. it probably is more common than I am aware of. I think a very small subsection of people will actually bring their reptile into the vet. So probably it's happening more often than we even know about. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. And in terms of the actual mechanism of what is happening, maybe we could chat just a little bit about that. When you're, the animals are given vitamin D, okay, I guess the other important thing to note is that you can't really overdose on calcium either, or you can't overdose a, an animal on calcium. Not really. You theoretically you could, but I think you would have to really try hard. I don't think you could, you know, you could give an animal too much calcium. Um, you know, you would have to be like spooning them tons of calcium supplement or something. So just by dusting your, your, your feeders or something, no, you're not going to overdose with calcium. But I guess the, and the issue really arises with the excess of vitamin D. Yeah. So the vitamin D, um, Usually what happens is the ex- excess vitamin D causes calcification of the organs. Uh, and that varies based on the amount and the species that you're talking about. But usually it's the kidneys and they will literally start turning to stone. They, they calcify. And so they get kidney failure. Um, but any of the organs can calcify. And I found calcified livers um, you'll find streaks of, of calcium in the intestines and things like that. So basically, they, they turn to stone and the organs don't function like they're supposed to anymore. So is it their, so their bodies just continue to retain the calcium that they're ingesting because of the high levels of vitamin D in their body? Correct. So normally, the, they have cells in their skin that produce a, a precursor to vitamin D and the UV light hits that. Uh, and converts it. And it goes through several conversions until you have what we we think of as vitamin D. Um, and it's distributed in the liver and throughout the body and does its thing. Um, and the as long as the vitamin D is there, it tells the intestines to absorb calcium. Um, and so normally, you know, you would have a, a cutoff. It wouldn't be producing all that vitamin D all day because of the sun setting and, you know, them coming in and out of basking. So there'd be a break. And so while this vitamin D is, is in there, they just continue uh, absorbing calcium. And so they have to send it somewhere. And so they distribute it throughout the body and it just ends up building up. Yeah. And I assume once the organs start to calcify, that's not something you can really reverse. It's probably something you can just manage or? Yeah, you can. If you find it really early, you can stop it. 
but you can't fix what is already calcified. Um, so you can give them some, some medications that can help uh, pull all of that calcium out, um, but it's not usually very effective. Usually by the time we see them, they're so far gone, there's not a whole lot that we can do. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. That's sort of the this sort of the, how most reptiles go as soon as they start showing illness it's it's kind of too late in a lot of ways correct yeah by the time you notice they've probably been sick for a long time mm-hmm. and so with the oh i was gonna oh yeah yeah with, with the calcium with the hyper because this would be almost symptoms of hypercalcemia and i i know one of the interesting things about it is it it's sort of this symptomatic of also hypocalcemia. So sometimes people miss the diagnosis of having too much calcium when because the symptoms are so similar to, you know, what you might see in an animal that's not getting enough calcium. Yeah, sometimes, um, you know, again, there, it's not a very specific finding. Most of the things that make reptiles sick, they all sort of present the same way. Right. Um, so it's really hard to differentiate exactly what's going on. You can't just... Uh, bring a reptile in for an exam and have a list of symptoms. And we can't really know for sure unless we actually get some blood and look at the levels. Um, That's the only way to have an actual diagnosis. Otherwise, most of the time we can make an educated guess based on our exam and husbandry information. Um, But really we have to look at at the, the levels in the blood to make an accurate diagnosis. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. And so in terms of the actual industry that the, the companies that are providing this, uh, the supplements and whatnot, do you, do you have, like, do you have a preference of where they should go? Like, do you think synthetic vitamin D should be slowly removed as long as UVB is being promoted? It's kind of a slippery slope in some ways. I know. I think our problem is in the beginning, you know, I don't know, 30 years ago when reptiles were really starting to become popular, we sort of had an idea that they needed um, calcium and vitamin D. And we sort of knew that they got uh, vitamin D from the sun, but didn't really understand the process. And we didn't have the technology to have a bunch of UV bulbs and things like we do now. So logically, we assumed we'll just supply it in the diet. And so that kind of caught on. And then slowly, as we understood more, I think the industry caught up and started producing UV lights and other things but never went back and addressed the fact that now we have this synthetic vitamin D in everything. Uh, and, and I think it's tough because, you know, it's a moneymaker and they want to sell a bunch of stuff. So it's hard for them to voluntarily say, Hey, we found out this isn't so good. You know, we should educate people or pull it from the shelves. Yeah. So, yeah, it's definitely tricky because then if you pull it from the shelves, people who aren't using UVB are going to create MBD. And it's right. yeah, it's, it's definitely, I, I was actually the podcast that I released this morning, I was talking to to the gentleman, we, he was saying that I think it was ZooMed sells, you know, a, um, a chameleon kit and it comes with UVB lighting and vitamin D yeah. calcium supplement. And, and that's just, that's brutal. It's, it's yeah. almost like they didn't think about it far enough down the road to realize that it's they're actually selling poison in, in that case. Yeah, they, they didn't think about it. And also, I think in exotic husbandry and the reptile community more specifically, things become kind of dogma or they, they just become like this accepted thing. Everybody knows you need vitamin D. And that's just kind of the way it is. And everybody just knows that it's a fact. And we never kind of moved beyond that. And so, it, you know, it's kind of like everybody thinks birds eat seeds. So every time you buy a bird, you buy seeds. But really, that's incorrect. But it's hard for people to stop because we have generations of people giving vitamin D to their reptiles. And when you have somebody say, hey, you shouldn't do that, I think they're a little suspicious because that's what everybody has been doing. Everybody knows that. And now why is this person saying otherwise? Right. So I guess in terms of people listening, um, for just some tools they can have in their mind, if you're providing UV light and consistently updating your bulbs, is there any need for synthetic vitamin D ever? No. Okay. So no, you if just... you, yeah. If they have the correct bulbs um, and they're the correct distance from the enclosure and you've taken everything else like that into consideration, the reptile will produce its own vitamin D and has no need for exogenous synthetics at all. And like you said earlier, the when, when they're producing their own vitamin D, it is so much healthier because there's no chance of overdosing and it's actually going through the, the biological mechanics that it's supposed to. Right. They, they cannot overdose because they're, they're, they have feedback mechanisms that uh, update their bodies with how much is in the system. 
um, and they will either stop basking or they can just shut down production themselves. So it's much easier really to let them do their own thing and not worry about supplying it. Right. So really the only people that should be using synthetic vitamin D is if you're not providing UVB. Correct. If you do not have UVB, um, you should be providing. But I think everybody, I think all reptiles should have access to UV lighting. Yeah. And that would simplify things uh, a lot, really. A lot. Tons. Yeah. It would be much easier. And uh, so one of the areas that I I want people to, to listen to is that a lot of crested gecko diets have synthetic vitamin D. And it's just mixed into this general powder. And for example, my crested gecko, he eats Pangea. And then that's really what he only eats. I'm slowly trying to move him to a different food because he does have UVB lighting now. Luckily, since he's nocturnal, it's probably not as much of a risk. Maybe maybe you would have an answer to that. But but now he's he has he's kind of getting both at this point. And I could probably pull off the synthetic vitamin D completely, even though he is nocturnal. Right. Uh, yeah. So that's another hard thing is um, something like crested geckos. Again, it's, you know, everybody knows that crested geckos don't need UV light. So they've just been feeding things like Pangea uh, and it has everything in it and everybody thinks they've been doing okay. But really, even nocturnal animals or crepuscular animals still need UV light and they still process it um, whether we want whether we want to supply it or not. You know, naturally, they, they just do better with it. But it's hard when you know, what else is there to feed a crested gecko? There's only so many commercial diets available. And I think all of them have vitamin D. Um, You know, there's also, I think we overfeed some of those commercial diets. I I think we need to feed more insect prey to them as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, but uh, that's also another thing that's very difficult to overcome. Yeah, no, definitely, because it's so simple, right? You got the powder right. and they're good to go. And, and uh, Arcadia Reptile does sell their crested gecko, c- crested gecko diet does not have vitamin D in it. So if anyone's oh, listening, and it, although I've, I've found my gecko has been fairly reluctant to eat it, so that, that's another challenge. But, yeah. but still, that will be my goal in the end. And I think, well, he was out earlier, but he, he, he does come out during the day, you know, once in a while. The lights are on, he'll come out and he'll bask under the UV and He's not out every single day, but right. quite often, a couple times a week, he'll be out. Yeah, they um, they did a few studies on, you know, of course, every single species of reptile is going to be different. Mm-hmm. So it's hard to make vast generalizations, but they did some studies on a few nocturnal and crepuscular reptiles, and they actually um, process um, UV light, they metabolize vitamin D much more efficiently than like, uh, diurnal reptiles that are out in the afternoon sun. So they need to be exposed for much less time. And the rays don't have to be as strong as, as something else like, uh, you know, like an agamid lizard that is basking at noon. So yes, they're not out there like sitting there under the lights, but they don't need to because they've evolved to be more efficient with the way that they use the UV light that is provided. Right. Yeah, that makes total sense. I mean, I mean, even if you look at uh, plants that grow on the f- floor of the rainforest, they have these am- amazing abilities to you know open up their cells when the sun hits them for, you know, half a fraction of a second and because they're constantly exposed to darkness and they'll use the light when it's there. So that makes total sense that that nocturnal animals would be the same way. So I guess for, for anybody to sort of wrap up this topic, UV is the way to go. And if you're using synthetic vitamin D, you should be careful with it, especially if you if you have UV light, you can get rid of it completely. And if you don't, then you should maybe consider going to UV. Yeah, I think I think UV light is the way to go. It has so many more benefits than just vitamin D. But if for some reason someone just says, I'm not going to do it, be very careful with, with the vitamin D that you are feeding um, and look at the product and have an idea of actually how much you're giving, mm-hmm. you know, and, and if you notice anything unusual, you should go to the vet and just get it, you know, get everything checked out just to make sure because it is treatable if it's caught early. Right. Yeah. And maybe we'll just linger on UVB lighting just for a little bit longer. I think the only case that I've heard for people not wanting to use UV is for albino animals because they've noticed that the they're very sensitive to the light and they actually, I, I mean, it makes sense that they're typically albinos have very sensitive eyes to bright light. So I don't know if, if there's, maybe there's ways around that. Maybe you can vi- provide a lot more shade, but other than that, or I mean, maybe even in that scenario, UV should still be provided, but is, is there any, is there any scenario that UV sh- shouldn't be or people you know people claim that they don't need it it's actually harmful i i don't know of any reason 
why you would not provide it. I, I can't think of any reason other than um, you just don't want to go to the expense or, or change your setup. But really, there's no medical reason that I can think of that you wouldn't have it for any reptile. Right. So as a vet, you have never seen a case where UV has been a detriment to the animal. No, I have seen um, some burns and some bl- some blindness caused by um, like those old, uh, like the mercury vapor lights, things like that. Like when it were really, really bright lights and they were too close to the enclosure. Yes, we did see some burns and things uh, in albino animals or animals that were just lighter colored. But I think with the lights that we have now, as long as you're using them at the appropriate distance and you have cover for the animal to go to, I don't think you should worry about, you know, causing any burns or any issues like that. Yeah. I, that's the other thing is that if, when the animal has freedom to move from one place to another, from shade to uh, out in the basking zone, they are very good at self-regulating. Just like a human, if you're in the sun, you're going to start to feel yourself, you know, getting too hot. You're going to slide into the shade. The animals are fully capable of that. Yeah, they, you know, they self police and they'll, they'll move if they need to, or if it's too bright, they'll go somewhere else. Um, it's just if you don't have anywhere for them to escape to, maybe you could have an issue. But I, I think with today's technology, that's, that's pretty, um, that's not very likely to happen. Okay, that's awesome. I think that wraps up that topic. And we kind of touched on the second topic I wanted to talk about, which was obesity, which yeah. I think is probably fairly prevalent. Is this something that you see all the time in the clinic or or quite often? I see it pretty often. Um, Where I work, I I see lots of bearded dragons and I see lots of ball pythons um, and then kind of a smattering of other species. But those two seem to be obese a majority of the time that I see them. From the naked eye, when you look at them right away, are, are you just able to tell instantly that these are obese animals or is it more feeling that you can tell? Because, I mean, a lot of people have obese animals without even realizing. Yeah, I think um, if they are very much obese, yes, you can tell. Um, like snakes, sometimes they can be so obese that you can see the skin in between their scales because they're, they're literally stretched out um, or they'll appear very, very round. Um, you know, sausage like, and that, you know, is an, is an indicator bearded dragons. It can be a little more difficult because they're kind of flat and pancake shaped anyway, when they're just hanging out on the exam table. Um, but if you palpate them, that's, that's the biggest clue because they have these two, um, fatty bodies inside of their coelom that they use to store their fat. And you can feel those. And some, in some animals, they take up the majority of the space. Mm. Because reptiles store fat in very different ways than mammals store fat as far as i can tell or it seems it's not like a subcutaneous fat that we're used to in ourselves so what is what are the differences in the way the two an, or two two types of animals actually store their fat so uh, a lot of species of reptiles have um specific they're not really organs but but specific places like those fatty bodies where the fat will go to um or they do, they store it uh, in their coelom, in their abdomen, um, and just kind of fill up empty space with it, or it'll go around the heart or the kidneys. Uh, mammals, uh, you can have fat in the abdomen of a mammal or, or fat around the organs, but, but we tend to store fat under our skin. Right. And is it, is it harder for, I don't, maybe this question won't make sense, but I feel like for, for humans anyway, if you have a bunch of subcutaneous fat, you can actually burn it off relatively easy by changing your diet and, and, and whatnot. But I, I feel like when you have a very obese animal, it's actually or a very, very obese reptile, it's hard for them to start to shed that weight or are people just not you know providing enough physical activity for them or, or restricting their food enough? I, I think it's a combination. I, I, I think diet is more important um, you know, you with, well, with mammals, you know, for instance, for a dog, um, you can have an obese dog and you can exercise them all the time, but if you're overfeeding them, they're not going to outrun that, those excess calories. So same thing for a reptile, you know, good luck getting them to move around more, you know, I, I, that's another issue I think with, um, environmental enrichment, but even then, they're just not made to walk around and move around all the time. And so you really have to restrict their diet and be careful what you're feeding them. 
Right. Yeah. And, and you're totally right about the sort of sausage, sausage shaped snakes. And I had sent you that uh, Facebook post a few weeks back of somebody that had a, saw, a, one of their yeah. Burmese pythons. Yeah. They had a huge, I think it was like 22 feet Burmese python from as far as the owners were concerned, they, they took great care of it. And obviously they were reptile people, so they were knowledgeable. And when it passed away, they opened it up and, and did a little sort of post-mortem on it and it was just full of fat bodies and they could actually tell that it died of a I think a heart uh, basically a heart attack yeah I think um if you're not really familiar with reptiles and you haven't seen a lot of a particular species it can be hard to tell and I also think a lot of uh you know like Instagram and Facebook and all that a lot of the reptiles that I see people post about are overweight or not, you know, in good condition for other reasons, but those are very popular. And so I think in our minds, you know, the general public doesn't really have a good idea about what a healthy body weight is for a reptile. Mm -hmm. Oh, that totally. And it's, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Dave Kaufman, Kaufman's YouTube channel, but he, he does these great things where he goes down to these areas like the rainforest in Brazil, or he was just in, um, I guess, Indonesia, looking for wild reticulated pythons. And whenever he finds a wild counterpart of the animals that we have in the hobby, they look almost like ill because they're so thin, yeah. you know, but they're not ill. They're actually a healthy weight. We're just not right. used to seeing that body shape. Like reticulated pythons, we just see these huge donut shaped things, but in the wild, they're actually look quite arboreal in, in a lot of ways. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I think there's a good middle ground. I mean, you know, they are not wild, they are captive. So we don't want them to be quite so food deprived. But at the same time, um, you know, we like chunkier looking animals, we think fat cats and puppies are really cute. And I think that has spilled over into reptiles. So it's really hard for somebody to look at a at an animal that appears too skinny, but in reality, that's better for them. And they've even done some studies on, uh, I can't remember the particular species of boid, but um, they live longer when we calorie restrict them. You know, when, when, when breeders often like to really feed them a lot because they have to get them breeding and produce as many offspring as possible, but that seems to shorten their lifespan. Yeah. Oh yeah. That power feeding clearly does that. And, and Vin Russo, who's a pretty prominent uh, boa breeder in the States, he was the first person that I heard talk about. He actually does not feed his boas in the winter months. He basically yeah. fasts them from 60 to 90 days. And I, I've been doing that with my boas slowly, you know, ex over the years, increasing their, their fast length in, in the winter time. And, and this is their longest fast they've ever been on. They'll be fed again next week, but it'll be basically 60 days since they've eaten. And I just out of curiosity, I weighed them all last week. They have not lost a gram. They they are literally the same weight they were when we started the fast. And I needed to see that because I start to feel bad. You you start to anthropomorphize it in a way. You're like, oh my yeah. God, like 70 days, I'd be dead. I'd be long dead. Yeah. And then you pull them out and you're like, wow, there's just no difference here. <laughs> yeah, they're they're just not the same as mammals and they're definitely not the same as people. And you know, like if I'm sitting on the couch. I want to be eating something because that's what <laughs> that's what I do when I'm bored. And I think a lot of people, you know, you you do anthropomorphize and you think, well, I would be bored or I would be hungry. And also it's, you know, it's exciting to feed your reptiles. That's one of the few times that you can really interact with them or see them do something. And and I get that. I think a lot of people enjoy that, but we do it too much. You know, we don't, we don't realize that. And I get a lot of phone calls of people saying, you know, my snake hasn't eaten in two weeks. And I have to tell them that that's not a big deal. You know, weigh them. I always tell people, as long as they haven't lost 10% of their body weight, you're probably fine as long as all your other parameters are okay. It's okay for them to go, you know, a couple weeks or, or however long without eating as long as otherwise they're healthy. Yeah, I mean, and even with humans, we're starting to realize that restricting some calories and doing some fasting is actually healthy for you rather than constantly having your system, your digestive system working to digest the, the chips that we're eating, you know, right, for sure. Yeah, I think it's healthier for, for everybody, but it's, it's, it's difficult. Do you think that obviously ball pythons are notorious for going on food strikes? Do you think that's related to overfeeding? Obviously, there are other things that that play into it, like hormones and, and, and breeding and whatnot. But I always wondered if maybe they're just, well, I guess maybe they're op opportunistic feeders. So they're going to take food any no matter what when they're when they're feeding ready to eat. I think pro probably it's a combination. I think we're probably overfeeding. But I also think we don't provide them or well, let me rephrase, I think most people 
don't probably provide them with the environmental enrichment, with the photo period, with everything else that they need. And I don't think we even truly understand how all of those things uh, interplay and affect their hormones and affect the enzymes and their you know metabolism. And so I think more likely if we started changing our husbandry practices and did a better job, I think we would see less snakes, ball pythons that, that go on hunger strikes. Yeah, because they are definitely the species in the hobby that gets the shortest end of the stick in terms of the care because they have become so industrialized. I mean, the tub systems have really taken over in ball pythons more than anything. Yeah, and I think, what, you know, why why would you want to eat if you're just constantly fed and you just sit in a tub, you have no no stimulus to do anything else? You know, I, I think that's probably a big part of why. There could be other reasons and, you know, we don't know enough, I, I don't think. We haven't done enough testing and, and followed ball pythons throughout their lives and done blood work and everything to really say for sure. But I do think that if we provided them with more enrichment and, and took better care of their, their needs, we wouldn't see as much. So as a, as a vet, how do you, because I'm sure you have many people that come in that do keep their animals in fairly plain enclosures and in sort of industrial style, newspaper, water dish type setups. And I'm sure you want to promote more enrichment, but at the same time, you don't want to promote the type of enrichment that's going to lead to the animal being unhealthy if the person's incapable of caring for them in this more advanced way. Yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult. Uh, and you know, like we have a lot of, um, I think it's becoming, um, kind of passe to keep things on sand, for instance, you know, because people are worried about foreign bodies. And so that's become a thing. But I think really, if you, if you kept an animal properly, and it was on the proper substrate, you wouldn't have to worry so much about them eating things or having foreign bodies. And so it, it's hard to tell a brand new keeper, you know, you need to have a light, you you should really have a um, a timer on that light. You should really change the heat. You should really do all of these things because all they see are dollar signs. And right. and it's hard when they were sold a critter keeper and a piece of reptile carpet and, and told that's all you need. So, yeah. Is that the type of client you see the most of? Are the, are the people that just kind of walk into PetSmart and end up leaving with an animal that they didn't quite know how to care for? Most of the time, uh, I see people like that or I see... Um, really advanced reptile keepers that have lots of animals, but they tend to do the rack system or something similar. Every once in a while, I'll get, uh, oddly enough, it, it usually is like the 11 year old kids that have the best husbandry, take the best care. They have notes on everything. They weigh their animal, you know, they have like bioactive setups, all kinds of stuff. Uh, but that's pretty rare to have somebody that is doing that much. So if you have a client that comes in that has their, you know, critter keeper with their carpet and whatnot, is, is there any, ch any way you change their mind or do they just kind of leave and go, well, that guy doesn't know what he's talking about. I, I tell people, you know, why they should change. I, I have a bunch of handouts that I'll give people so they can go look the information up um, elsewhere. Uh, and I just tell them, you know, it's expensive to come to the vet. And if you, do all of these things, really reptiles are pretty healthy. So yes, you're going to put the money in right now for a new light and heating and all of that, but then you won't have to come see me as often because you're not going to have as many problems. And sometimes that works. I've also told people, you know, hey, you should do some testing or something, but it's not going to get any better because you don't have the proper temperatures why don't you save the money from, you know, the blood work that we should do and promise me that you'll go buy a heater or a UV light or something. And yeah. sometimes that works. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because the idea of providing enrichment doesn't come along with reptiles in the same way it, it would come with birds or, or even rodents. Like we, if you buy rats, like you got your toys and things to play mm -hmm. with and birds, of course, there's just tons of toys for them to keep their minds occupied. Yeah. But environmental enrichment and reptiles just don't click together for some reason in, in the mainstream pet, pet world. Yeah. And I, I think it's, you know, again, like everything, uh, you know, several different things, but I think we, for a long time, 
didn't think maybe reptiles were as intelligent or had the need for environmental enrichment. We just kind of thought, well, you know, they're dumb, they're reptiles, they don't have the brain that will process things. And so we just kept them in these plain enclosures and assumed they were doing okay. But really, we just didn't know what to look for. As a vet, what makes you think that they require environmental enrichment? Is there any cues that you go off of that you just think, yeah, this is why they need that? Uh, I see a lot of, well, so obesity. Um, I see a lot of like uh, nose rubbing in snakes and and monitor lizards. Um, And I think that's probably because the enclosure is too small or there's not enough hiding places. Um, you know, things like that. Or they'll tell me, well, they just sit there and it'll be a particularly active species, but it's just something that hangs out because there's no reason for it to move around. Right. Um, I also go by, even though we don't know for sure what a reptile is thinking, if I can provide something and it's safe and it's not going to have a negative effect, why not provide the most that you can? You know, there, there's no harm in it. And I think we will eventually have actual facts that we can point to and say this actually does work but why not do the best you can now anyway yeah yeah we're definitely stuck in that limbo where we're we're trying to work our way there but there's not enough science foundation to just point to something immediately i mean there's there is plenty of of research out there now but there's just there's like you said there's really not enough to to just go this is this like the minimum standard of care you know yeah and i think you know they're not um i think environmental enrichment too people think like elephants at the zoo kicking balls or having tire swings or, you know, I think we can go much simpler with reptiles and you can put, you know, like PVC pipe tubes for them to crawl through or simulate, um, you know, like a, a mouse den for them to go get their prey out of, or, ch- you know, just change things around for them to climb on. It doesn't have to be like complex mazes and things like that. It doesn't have to be something involved and very expensive. Yeah, just a, a stick, put a stick in there, something yeah. different for them to investigate. Yeah, really, like provide them a new branch to climb on that smells differently than what they have. I, I think that's probably um, good enough for many species. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. So one of the other uh, questions that continued to come up when I asked uh, the listeners a qu- what questions they'd ask a vet is just the idea of finding a vet. And, and I think especially, I guess these people obviously are not part of the cricket keeper or the um, critter keeper carpet people. These are people who are in the industry and have many animals and really care for their animals. Yeah. And I think they sort of have a lot of times the same sort of vibes you would get when you go into a pet store. Like, you know, when you go into a pet store, you have the guy that's trying to tell you about the crested gecko and you're like, you don't really know what you're talking about type thing. I think that's how they interpret vets a lot of the time. Yeah. Does that sound like, is, what, what, is there any way around that? I think it's hard. And I, uh, I get it a lot, um, especially, you know, sometimes I'll look at forums and things and vets are just lambasted on there and, and uh, treated like very suspiciously. And I get it from a point because there was a time when we did not know anything. You know, reptiles weren't seen as anything. Anybody would want to spend money on what was the point. So you just had a few people that were like, yeah, I'll see your iguana, but they didn't know. And so I I think a lot of people have kind of had this like uh, inherited memory, you know, passed down through reptile keepers of that kind of thing. Um, And unfortunately, a lot of veterinarians don't understand reptiles and will say, yeah, I'll see it. And they have the best of intentions but they don't know what they don't know. And so that's not really great for us as a profession. Um, That is changing. And now you can find um, board certified exotic vets. Um, You can also go to um, ARAV.org, which is the Association of Reptile and Amphibian Veterinarians. And they have a location function where you can find not necessarily a board certified vet, but somebody who is in that organization um, near you. And I I think people who invest the time and the money to join that organization are going to be more knowledgeable about reptiles than somebody who is not. Um, The board certification in reptile medicine itself is somewhat new. So not a lot of people have it. Um, I am not certified. Um, I'm working towards it, but I do not, I'm not a board certified specialist. So is that the, that 
American Board of Veterinary Practitioners. Is that is that yeah. the same board? Yeah, that is the same board, and I believe I believe that is the same board for for most of for North America in general. Um, there might be something else in Europe, but I believe Canada, United States, and Mexico even are all can all be um, ABVP certified veterinarians. Yeah, that was one of the questions that when somebody had asked, it's you know how come you can take your uh, reptile to see any vet, but there's only twelve or fourteen A A B V P certified vets in a country or something like that. Yeah. But I guess is that certification quite a long process? Like if you're working towards it, what do you have to do to get there? So there's two routes. You can either go right out of school uh, and you can do um, an internship. Usually they want you to do like a small animal internship. So that'd be like dog and cat. And then you would do like an exotics internship. And then you would do a residency specifically for reptiles. Um, and then you have to take a test. And it's really hard to even get a place in an internship because there are so few places that will take you and there's huge competition. So there's no guarantee you will even end up in the internship. Um, so a lot of people try and they just cannot find a place that will accept them. And so the other option is once you've been out of school for five years, you can um, go through the ABVP and you will, um, you have to see a specific caseload percentage of the species that you want to be boarded in. You have to have papers submitted um, and published, um, and which takes a lot of work. And then you have to take a test. Um, and all of that takes time and money. Uh, you know, it costs several hundred dollars to do the test and many hours of studying. So it's not an easy process. Um, and then at the end, if you do get certified, I think what people have to understand is you as a pet owner, you know, you're going to be paying more to go see a board certified veterinarian than you would someone who is not, which I think is fair. They did so much more work and everything and they, their knowledge base is incredible. But, you know, it, they are going to charge more because you're really paying for their expertise. Right. Yeah. So the fact that there's only 12 or 14 is not really indicative of the people who are, you know, vets who are experts in reptiles. They're just people that have actually worked towards that and, and put in the time and spent the money. And, and it's Correct. great that they have that, but that doesn't certainly doesn't mean that they're the only 12 uh, on the continent that know about reptiles. Right. Far from it. There are lots of people that know just as much or more than the people that have been board certified, but for whatever reason, you know, are working towards it, or they don't have the money for the test or, you know, something else. So yes, it'd be fantastic if you could go see um, a board certified reptile vet. But I think, you know, the next step down would be an ARAV member, um, you know, because they also put the time in and, and do continuing education and everything as well, and are going to be more knowledgeable than somebody who is not in the organization. Right. In terms of continuing education, what are some things, is that something that you have to drive yourself or are there things that just kind of come to you uh, for opportunity, like learning opportunities to advance your skill set? Uh, it's a mixture of both. Uh, depending on where you are uh, in the United States, um, the amount of hours you need per year varies a little bit. Um, but usually it's something like 20 or 30 hours of continuing education every year. And that can be going to um, there's lots of conferences and you'll attend lectures uh, and each lecture is usually an hour. And so that's one hour of continuing education. Um, you can get a few hours by reading journal articles and submit like a summary. Uh, but most veterinarians go to conferences and there are, there's a great big conference every year called Exotic Con and it's um, the reptile or uh, vets, small mammals. So like uh you know, ferrets and rabbits and things, and then avian vets, and they have one giant conference every year. Interesting. Yeah. So you can kind of co collaborate and, and learn some new things. Of, of course, research never stops. So I'm sure there's always new things to learn. Yeah, there's always something new or something has changed. Uh, even year to year, it's something you learned the, the last year, they'll be like, hey, we have an update. This is different now. Mm. Are there any resources that you would recommend? Is there, there are some people who, who feel like they aren't close to a vet anywhere. There, there's nowhere where they can find a good uh, exotic vet. Is there places online or, or books or resources that you can point people towards that would help them uh, just to generally care for their animals? Uh, again, I'd say ARAV.org. Um, they have lots of handouts. They have information 
um, and it's all been, you know, approved by veterinarians, so you know that it's correct. So that's one big source. Um, uh, Melissa Kaplan had a website. Uh, it's a little bit outdated, but it's still pretty good. Mm -hmm. And then there's um, Reptifiles is a pretty good information source. Those are usually where I recommend people go because everything has been researched and you can see where they're getting their information from. It's not just somebody saying, I've done this for 20 years and it worked. Yeah, yeah. I definitely know Mariah at Reptifiles is, spends a ton of time reading and, and, and going through the scientific literature to make sure that the, whatever's on our website is up to date. Um, the other thing I was going to ask you about, and this is somebody that one of my, one of my friends had reached out to me, and, and I don't know if, if you have an answer to this, but he, he, they had, a, a, I guess, a rare viper species that was, he said it had a similar condition that you, see, that you can see in many boas, which is fluid building up around the heart. And uh, he, he said he didn't know the name of the condition, but it's something that does happen very uh, commonly, I guess, in boas. But basically, they were draining the fluid around the heart, and eventually they lost the viper, which was unfortunate because it was just rare species, and, and they didn't really have enough time to figure out what was wrong with it. it? Do you have any ideas on that? Oh, that could be so many things. So flu fluid around the heart is, is, is called pericardial effusion, but that can be caused by any number of, of, of diseases or, or parasites or, you know, cancers. Um, so I can't say in that specific case, what that could be. Yeah. That's, that's really unfortunate though. That's a really terrible thing to have happen. Yeah, yeah, I guess they were obviously doing the the pericardial drain over and over again, and then eventually just uh, lose the animal. But um, so, in terms of uh, one of the other questions we had was is is cancer common in reptiles? Yeah, well, I think it is common, but we don't we don't know for sure how common. Again, a lot of things with reptiles, they just aren't brought in to see a veterinarian, and if they are. A lot of times we aren't uh, able to do any diagnostic testing, so it's hard to say for sure. But definitely, yes, the, there are documented cases of reptiles getting cancer. Um, I, I know a lot of people think they can't, they can't get cancer or they're immune or something, but but they're not. They get um, pretty much any cancer uh, people or any other you know animal can get. You can find in a reptile. Yeah, it's, I think sometimes people interpret cancer as almost like a virus or a bacteria or something when it's, it's certainly not that. And, and then they think like when you, you can't really be immune from, from something like cancer. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, it can be caused by viral infections, but that it's not so much the virus itself, but rather something to do with the infection has caused mutations in the DNA. And so the cells start growing unusually and can become a cancer. Right. Um, but yeah, so no, no animal is immune, um, to cancer as far as I know, because all, you know, all animals have DNA that can mutate and, and cause cells to grow, uh, aberrantly. Yeah, that makes sense. In, in terms of just staying up to date with your animal's health, do you recommend people do checkups, sort of annual checkups with their animal, or is it more so bring them in when you see something? I tell all of my, uh, clients that, they should come in when they first get an animal, you know, come in within a couple days of purchasing uh, just to get it looked at um, and bring a fecal sample so that we can look for parasites. And then as long as your animal is doing well, eating, you're, you know, defecating, behaving normally, I usually recommend coming in every six months uh, because a lot of times you'll think they're actually doing well, but we'll find something on exam. And if we find it early, it's easy to fix and often less expensive than if something gets out of hand. Right. Yeah. As soon as you start having to do sort of catastrophic procedures to, to or interventions, then it's going to add a lot more money. Yeah, for sure. In terms of parasites, is that, are, are parasites incredibly common in these, in the captive, uh, captive bred and captive raised animals? Or do you guys see that a lot? Not so much. When we had like wild caught animals, tons of parasites, but not so much anymore. Um, I see a lot of pinworms uh, in bearded dragons and tortoises, but we're now starting to think they're not so much parasites, but um, like commensal organisms that actually help them with their digestion. So we don't tend to treat uh, you know, mild or moderate amounts of pinworms anymore because it seems like they actually help the animal. Huh. Uh, and then um, there are other strange, 
you know, um, parasites that sometimes will find. Chameleons used to get a type of nematode that you could find under their skin a lot, and you'd have to surgically remove it. But I think since a lot of things are now captive bred, we don't find too many. In terms of the just being a vet and, and, and dealing with, obviously, it's you have emotional highs and lows, I'm sure. Is do you find that tough to, to deal with the sadder side? And obviously it's, it, there's a lot of emotions that are pumping through you. Is that tough for you? It can be. I think, um, I usually if something really sad is happening, it's like a euthanasia. And for me, at least I, it is sad that the animal is gone and, and the people are going home without their pet. But I tend to think that for that particular animal, we've done them the last final kindness. You know, we've, we've, we've adopted this animal and taken it into our homes and cared for it. And I think that for a lot of, of pets, that's like the last responsible thing that you can do for them. And so it, it is sad, but um, uh, I feel like it, it's, it's a nice thing. It's a kind thing. And it's horrible for the people that are left behind. But often when we're putting an animal to sleep, it's the best thing for that animal. And so it doesn't bother me so much. Uh, I also, you know, I have to, I have to be my usual, my, my normal self when I go into the next room, you know, right. the, because these people now have a new puppy or they just got a snake from an expo. And so I, I have to try to not be upset, you know, from an appointment that I just did because I owe everybody you know, the same attention and, and everything else. So uh, sometimes I will be really upset, but I kind of have to put it to the side because I owe it to the next patient that, that they have all of my attention and everything directed upon them. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think that is in general why a lot of people decide that they don't want to be a vet. Right? They, they think a lot of kids want to be a vet and then they realize the sort of emotional toll and not everybody is built for that. Yeah, it, I mean, it is hard, but I think if you look at it from we're doing a service, you know, sometimes there's just nothing we can do anymore to help a pet. You know, we've run out of options and euthanasia is is the kindest thing, so they're not suffering anymore, you know. Um, and so if you look at it that way, it's not as horrible, at least for me. I'm not the one, you know, going home without my pet, though. Right. So, yeah, yeah, it, no. you know, it's hard for the people, but the more difficult part I think is dealing with upset people or people who don't understand what it is that we're trying to do. That really, that gets to me actually more than euthanasias or losing patience is, is unhappy people or people that accuse me of, you know, money mongering or something like that. That always stays with me. And, and I tend to think about that, you know, late at night or something. Yeah, that's yeah. Uh, that's definitely one of the areas where the vets get it the worst for sure is that that they th everybody thinks everything is a money grab with vets. Yeah. And uh, it's certainly not. I think we a lot of people forget how much you got done through just as much school as a doctor. Yeah. And and but for some reason vets get the short end. It's like you or you want to charge f to to fix my dog. It's like, well, I'm not going to do it for free. Yeah. I mean, and you know, they're upset and I understand, but it's like I think if they understood that I just saw 10 other people, you know, and maybe eight of those also, they love their animal just as much as you love this one. And they also don't have a lot of money, you know? So sometimes in the course of a day, I've been accused of being uncaring or being, you know, trying to take money from people 10 to 15 times, you know? Wow. And so that really wears on me because I, I do care about the animals. And if I, if I could, pay my bills and pay my student loans and just give everything away for free because I love it. I would, but you know, I have to get paid and I have technicians and client service representatives that all deserve to be paid for their work and we have to pay the electric bill. And so it, it's hard when you have something health related, but you also have to pay for it. Yeah, no, that that's for sure. In terms of the animals that come through the door, the, specifically the reptiles, this may be too general of a question, but is there a sort of a common illness that you see or a common mistake keepers are making that have that bring the animals in? I guess we probably maybe have covered them already with obesity and whatnot. Yeah, I think in general, I don't know, maybe 90% of the time when a reptile comes in and it's 
uh, you know, for whatever reason, the owners have brought it in. It's a husbandry related issue. Um, very rarely is it an actual, you know, like a primary illness. It's usually, you know, I will comb through everything and go through the history and their setup and everything. And almost always it's the temperature was incorrect or they don't have UV light or the diet is incorrect, something like that. Um, so yeah, it, it's not ever like one, you know, easy fix or something. Right. But husbandry errors are kind of the main, the main one. So in terms of for you, are you, do you just know the care for, obviously you probably have a great, a great idea of the care for the main species, but if someone brings in something that you've not seen before, I guess you have to go look at the resources and see how the, to, to care for that animal. You can't be expected to memorize every single husbandry care. Yeah. Sheet. Yeah, I know. I mean, I know a lot of the, you know, almost all the basic, really common things I know off the top of my head, but there are definitely animals that have come in um, and I'll see them on the schedule and I will have to look it up beforehand, you know, because I don't know the, you know, the preferred optimum temperature zone or something like that. So that does happen, but not too often. Yeah. I mean, I guess the common reptiles are so common that you're going to see lots of leopard geckos, crested geckos, bearded dragons, and ball pythons. For sure. Yeah. And I'd say that is the bulk of what I end up seeing. Right. Is there a common procedure that you have to do that? Is there any, any sort of, when you get into the medical side, is there anything that you do quite often? Um, I treat a lot of, um, metabolic bone disease. That's pretty common. And so usually that is, um, supplementing them, you know, with, with calcium. Um, I do a lot of foreign bodies in reptiles, um, a lot of sand impactions and things like that. Um, and, uh, I guess snakes, we see a lot of shedding issues again, that's kind of more really a husbandry issue, but you know, they have retained spectacles or something like that. Um, and upper respiratory things in snakes is also right. very common. Yeah. You definitely see, uh, our eyes all the time in the, in the snake world. Yeah. And I thought this was a interesting question that someone had asked in terms of venomous animals. Is there a place where people with venous, venomous animals can take their animals to the vet? Are, are you as an exotic vet willing to, to look at them or is that just kind of a case by case basis? I would love to, I, I think they're amazing, but I, because, you know, we have a busy hospital with cats and dogs and, you know, technicians that are not trained to handle venomous animals. I don't, uh, it would just be too much of a risk. Uh, but there are definitely, um, reptile, hospitals that will see venomous animals and do so often. Um, you just have to call or look. Um, and you know, those are going to be more difficult to find, but there are enough of them that, um, you know, a, a lot of my reptile colleagues are always posting about, you know, rattlesnakes or, you know, other things that they see. So it, it, it can be done. It is out there. Well, I think we've almost got through everything. There's a few more interesting questions that I have and then and then we'll kind of start to wrap up. We we did it. We did pretty good time here. Awesome. The the other question that I thought was really interesting from one of my listeners was your opinion on morph related genetic disorders and I'm not sure how often you run into these um, or if you have an opinion, but if you do. Uh I think um they definitely exist. Uh I know the more common you know, or the one that everybody seems to know about are the spider morph uh, ball pythons. And they definitely have um, a neurologic disorder. Um, and now it seems to be that it is related to the reduced melanin. And so when they're, when they're embryos, um, the, same, the same layer of cells that, that becomes melanin uh, also uh, is involved with brain formation. And so we've kind of disrupted that. And so that's why they have that intention tremor, or at least we believe it seems to be related to that. So, huh. um, and I'm sure there are lots of other, you know, who we know, who would have thought that, that the color of an animal would be related to the development of the brain. You know, we, we had no idea. So I'm sure there's many morphs and, um, you know, other genetic, um, uh, changes out there that have some linkage to some other body system that we don't even know about. Um, but you know, like the, the scaleless animals and some of the other really extreme color morphs do seem to have a lot more issues than 
wild type animals. And I think it's probably their immune systems aren't um, as, as efficient as they should be, but it could also be because there's some body system that it ha- has a genetic defect because of what we've done to the scales and the coloration. Yeah, it is pretty bizarre that the color can relate to something so dramatic as organ development. And I mean, you definitely see that people will have, they'll go to an expo, buy an animal that is, you know, really interesting, uh, sort of phenot- phenotype. And then maybe a year later, they just wake up and it's dead. And there was really no explanation. There was no sickness or anything. And um, it, you, it's probably, you know, a lung wasn't developed or something like that. And Yeah. I think it happens more often than we know. I, I think we are slowly in the reptile hobby. We're kind of um, doing to reptiles what we did to dogs. And so I, I worry that we are producing, you know, the, the English bulldogs and, and shih tzus of, of the reptile world. And people love those dogs and, you know, the they have a huge following, but they have lots of medical issues just because of the way that we have bred them to be um, shaped. And so yeah. that's happening for, for snakes and other reptiles too. And I think probably in the next 10, 15 years, we're going to be seeing a lot more issues. Yeah. As we continue to go down that, that road of finding new, interesting color morphs, we're going to continue to pop up different disorders for sure. Especially yeah. because of how closely these things are bred together, because the way you make these, you know, these, um, homozygous morphs is by, you know, inbreeding essentially. Yeah, I don't think it's great. And I I get it. You know, I think they're so cool. And, you know, I love all the different colors and patterns and things. I just wish we would be a little more responsible about it. And even, you know, even like the spider morph, we now know that there is an issue, but they're still being bred. Uh, People are still purchasing them and they're like, well, it's not that big of a deal. But I I just think that's that's not very responsible. And and eventually we're going to have, you know, a lot of problems um, that we could be. Uh, avoiding if we were just more responsible with how we did things now. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I mean, we know that there's an issue. There's so many other interesting morphs that we know are very stable. We should be focusing on those. And I'm totally with you. Like as from a scientist point of view, the fact that you can take a wild type ball python and after maybe like 30 years of different breeding, we have these unbelievable morphs. It's just, it's mind blowing that you can do that, you know, play dice with the, with the genes that much. But I do feel like once we find the ones, the combinations that don't work, we should put a sort of a cork in those ones and continue on. Yeah, I agree. Well, Andy, I really appreciate you coming by. This is a a great hour. I think we probably answered many questions that people have. So thank you so much. Is there anything left unsaid that you that you wish you had said or or that you that you wanted to say? Or did we cover it all? I think I would just say, be kind to your veterinarian. Uh, You know, be be responsible and do the research that you should do. And um, respect that when you go see them, you're not just paying for physical things, but for their expertise and their time. Uh, and, you know, as long as you're polite and, and treat them with respect, we, we want to help your animal and we'll do the best we can. But, um, you know, sometimes you, you do have to spend money um, or run diagnostics and that's not us, you know, trying to get money off of you. We just want to help. But, you know, we need we need information to offer the best care that we can. Yeah. As you're speaking, I, I think we, I can just get everybody to run through a very simple mental exercise. It's It'd be very easy to see how vets are not in it for the money because so many of us wanted to become vets and none of us got there because we wanted to be rich. All of us got there because we had a deep love and a passion for animals. And even if you didn't become a vet, you know that that's why vets are vets. No one says, I'm going to be a vet to become rich. Right. Yes. And definitely there are no rich vets. So <laughs> I, I promise. Yeah, yeah. Well, Andy, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for having me. This was great. And that brings us to the end of another episode. Thank you very much for listening. Dr. Anderson, thank you so much for joining me. I really absolutely appreciate you spending the hour with me. And as I said, after we recorded the show or we communicated afterwards that I would love to have you back on. Veterinary medicine is an evergreen topic, and I'm sure the listeners will agree. There is constant learning and constant development, and as as keepers, we're always looking to learn more from vets, so I think we'll definitely have you back on to discuss more topics. But for now, this is going to be a perfect resource for everybody. If you did enjoy the episode, make sure you share it on Facebook, share it with your friends and family, get everybody to listen to it. I'm going to split this up into a bunch of small, shareable clips on YouTube as well, so keep an eye open for that. A rating and a review on the Apple Podcasting app always helps me out. 
You can go to animalsathome.ca slash shop to pick yourself up a shirt or a sweater. And thank you very much to customreptilehabitats.com for sponsoring the show. If you do need anything reptile related, definitely go check them out. Links are in the show notes and the description. I will talk to you guys next week.